नमस्ते श्रीजीत जी नमस्ते श्रीहरि हाउ आर यू डूइंग आई एम वेल आई एम वेल हाउ आर यू श्रीजीत जी आई एम गुड आई एम गुड यस यू आर वेरी क्लियर ऑडिबल एंड आल्सो विजिबल ऑल गुड आई डू नो वुड यू आल्सो लाइक टू शेयर योर स्क्रीन श्रीजीत जी यस बिकॉज़ आई विल share a presentation actually yeah. so have you made me the co-host yes okay so let me try this So my screen is visible now. Yes, okay. it's visible, Shri Jiji. Great, great. So I'll just stop sharing for the time being. Uh, huh. We will start at eleven. Uh, we have four minutes. Sure. We okay. will begin with your intro, and then uh, the session will be handed over to you. Very well. Very well.
Namaste. Welcome to the second session for the day. Uh, under the Vishaya, India's Knowledge Systems Content, Public Leadership and IKS. And we are joined by uh, Shrizit Dattaji from Rashtram School of Public Leadership, who will be taking us through Neeti Shastra. I take this opportunity to introduce uh, Shrijit Dattaji. Shrijit Ji is the director of the Rashtram Center for Civilizational Studies and an assistant professor at the Rashtram School of Public Leadership, Rishihud University, Sonipat Haryana. Shrijit Ji is a scholar in the fields of aesthetic philosophy, Sahitya and Alankara Shastra. He grew up in Kolkata, West Bengal, took a BSc in Statistics from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, and an MA in Comparative Literature from Jadavpur University. After spending a couple of years as Junior Research Fellow at the Center for Comparative Literature in Vishwabharati Shanti Niketan, Srijit Ji joined Amrita Vishwavidya Peetam, Mysore campus as an assistant professor. He's a trained vocalist, having specialized in Hindustani music and Rabindra Sangeet. His areas of interest include aesthetic philosophy, Alankara Shastra, Sahitya, Darshana, Dandaniti, literary theory and criticism, comparative literature, comparative philosophy, bhakti and Vedic studies. Srijit Ji regularly writes research articles, book reviews and op-eds in both Bangla and English. He also writes poetry and drama in both languages and is an avid translator across Bangla, Hindi and English. Thank you so much, Srijit Ji, for joining us. I uh, humbly invite you to take over this. Namaste. Thank you, Srihari, for that very generous introduction. Uh, and uh, namaste to all the participants. Welcome uh, to all of you uh, to this particular session. Uh, I would like to uh, share my screen so that the slides are visible. Are the slides visible now? Yes, Srijiji. Okay. And uh, am I properly audible? Yes. Very good. So we'll begin. Uh, as you know, the topic today is uh, an introduction to Niti Shastra. Um, I'll have to add, with, uh, add this at the very beginning, at the outset, that uh, uh, one uh, hour is uh, uh, very little time to uh, do an exposition on uh, something as vast as Niti or Niti Shastra. Uh, so I'll try to give a brief overview of what uh, Niti Shastra is, uh, what sort of uh, topics and themes uh, are covered under this particular Shastra, and uh, try to give you a sort of flavor of uh, the various source texts upon which uh, Niti Shastra uh, depends. So. To begin with, uh, what we can expect to encounter during this uh, lecture, uh, we will start with a discussion of uh, defining Niti Shastra, the definition of Niti Shastra, and uh, uh, also an attempt to locate uh, this particular branch of uh, the Bharatiya knowledge system within the large uh, scope uh, of uh, the BKS or the Bharatiya knowledge systems. Uh, Niti Shastra, where does it uh, find its proper place within the Bharati knowledge systems is something that we will discuss at some length. We'll also uh, talk about the source texts of Niti Shastra, as I was telling you, which texts uh, are the main components which uh, make up or constitute this branch of Bharati knowledge systems. Uh, we will talk a little bit about a few of these texts, uh, such as Chanakya Niti Shastra, uh, Niti Shataka Bhartrihari and a very important one, Kamandakiya Niti Sara. We'll see how uh, these are uh, interrelated and how uh, one particular text uh, uh, or one particular definition of Niti Shastra and the texts uh, which are uh, which rely upon uh, such kind of a definition uh, take a more prominent place within the entire gamut of uh, Niti Shastra source texts. So we'll start by uh, trying to understand what Niti is. Uh, the word Niti uh, is a Sanskrit word that is derived from the root Ni, which means to lead or to attain. Uh, from this, the words Naya, uh, which means ethical or principled behavior. If you compare with uh, the word Vinaya, which is uh, 
specially principled behavior, you know, the disciplined behavior, uh, that sort of meaning is uh, implied uh, by the word naya. It, it also derives from the same root. And also nyaya, uh, which means system or harmony or logical or syllogistic argument or inference from which we have the nyaya darshana and even fair judgment. You know, uh, why uh, you might wonder why are these words uh, correlated or all these senses uh, uh, are contained within this particular word nyaya. Uh, why does nyaya uh, connote all these various senses, system, harmony, logical argument, uh, and the study of logical or syllogistic arguments, fair judgment, etc. It is because uh, in uh, Bharatiya knowledge systems, uh, as per the Bharatiya worldview, uh, uh, the understanding of our uh, knowledge system is that something which is fair is also harmonized, is also in harmony with uh, the components within itself as well as uh, whatever surrounds it. Therefore, uh, this word uh, has come to contain so many different uh, connotations. Anyway, so uh, just wanted to give you an overview of the kind of uh, words that have been derived from the same root from where niti is also derived. And uh, while describing the characteristics of uh, uh, danda niti, which is a specific uh, interpretation or definition of uh, the word niti, uh, one of the uh, very important uh, authors, authorities, not just author, but authority, uh, Kamandaka, uh, by whose name we have the uh, Kamandakya niti sara, uh, he has explained uh, the concept of uh, niti as that which facilitates accomplishment of something. Nayana uh, is called niti. Uh, so according to Kamandaka, that which facilitates nayana or the accomplishment of uh, something is niti. Uh, we will see that uh, this definition also finds an echo in uh, how uh, uh, in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna talks about Niti. Uh, but in today's uh, parlance, uh, the definition and scope of the word Niti has actually expanded to also include the scripture or the literature, the entire literature, uh, which discusses the human character on the basis of what is pure, what is impure, uh, what is true, what is false, right or improper, what is good and what is bad. So, uh, an entire literature which uh, discusses in a detailed manner the ethical and moral principles of conduct, of proper conduct and behavior, uh, that has also come to uh, denote uh, or connote one sense of uh, Niti Shastra as well as Niti. So um, another thing that you might find uh, very interesting is that uh, the uh, word Niti is often interchangeably used with the term dandaniti okay meaning they are sometimes used as synonyms of each other dandaniti and niti so we'll see so that is one way of interpreting uh, the word niti uh, and uh, we will discuss a little bit about this uh, particular interpretation of niti so we'll see what is niti in niti shastra uh, the different interpretations as i was uh, explaining. Uh, one interpretation can be uh, Niti is the means to achieve an organized uh, society or rashtra or nation uh, or a rajya which is a political entity. So the, the, the means, the methods through which you can achieve a well-organized society or a rashtra uh, or even a well-organized and uh, well-functioning political entity uh, or rajya that is understood as niti as per Bharatiya knowledge systems. The description and analysis of the policies uh, which will lead to good governance uh, is also included in uh, the scope of niti shastra and as a result it is also one way of uh, interpreting uh, niti. What niti is, it is the uh, uh, bunch of or set of policies which will lead to good governance, uh, well-functioning governance. And it is precisely in this sense that the word dandaniti is used. As I was telling you, that dandaniti is often interchangeably or synonymously used with the word niti. And 
uh, you can also find several other words which are used in that same sense of dandaniti uh, where we uh, have words like rashtra niti raja niti and even uh, arthashastra you know arthashastra is not just the uh, title of the text which is ascribed to kautilya but uh, it is also uh, the name the generic name of the branch of knowledge which discusses dandaniti uh, often there is a misconception that arthashastra is something that exclusively deals with uh, the subject of uh, what we call modern in modern times economics uh, okay or uh, some people um, uh, exclusively say that arthashastra is all about political science uh, or political economy but to truly understand what the uh, arthashastra of kautilya uh, actually discusses we have to understand what dandaniti is what is the scope of dandaniti it has a very vast scope as i was telling you that niti and dandaniti are often synonymously used so dandaniti can include discussions on how to evolve uh, a very well functioning uh, society as well as a uh, well functioning governance uh, a government rather but also it can include the proper conduct of the people who are members of that society uh, who are members of the government uh starting from the raja the the, the monarch uh, down to the uh, lowest hierarchical position uh, that a particular karmachari or a particular uh, employee of the government uh, can hold so all of that uh, comes into the purview of what we call the dandaniti in the bharatiya knowledge systems another way of interpreting or understanding niti would be upaya uh, upaya is uh, simply the means for success in any endeavor in any human endeavor the means that you use for uh, success that is called uh, uh, upaya and that is synonymously used with niti uh, as is often the case so in this context i would like to Uh, draw your attention to this particular phrase that has been used in the 38th shloka of the 10th chapter of bhagavad gita uh, where shri krishna says niti rasmi jigishata so what is uh, the meaning of this particular uh, phrase uh, if i translate it of those who are desirous of victory those who want to be victorious i am niti that's what shri krishna shri bhagavan declares Uh, uh the policy that points out the means to victory so in, in the same sense that upaya is understood as means for success so uh, if we try to understand uh, the meaning of niti it can be understood in this way that uh, niti is nothing but the set of means for achieving success in any endeavor next uh, there is this particular sense of niti uh in which it is used the term is used and that is hitavachana or anushasana vakya what is hitavachana or anushasana vakya uh the kind of uh, advice the kind of uh, maxims that can be shared with a group of people who are desirous to listen to such advice uh, uh so that their conduct their overall uh, uh their overall good is accomplished so whatever they are undertaking uh, they may be undertaking an endeavor in politics or or in uh, their uh, place of work or even in their personal lives so that which will lead to the fulfillment of their endeavor uh, that sort of advice is known as a uh, set of nitis in the sense of hitavachana or anushasana vakya the best example of using niti in this sense is found in the uh, text which is known as hitopadesha and finally niti is understood as uh, shishtacharana uh, that is proper or good conduct as i was telling uh, it can be understood uh, as a part of the niti of course but often uh, in various texts which are important to niti shastra for example the chanakya niti shastra that i mentioned uh, in the uh, contents which we are going to talk about uh, in a while that specifies uh, 
uh, a set of uh, maxims uh, uh, through verses it tries to un explain uh, and uh, expound what are the means to conduct in a particular setting in the proper way so given various situations various contexts uh, people are expected to behave in a certain manner and uh, the utmost uh, proper way of conducting in such situations are vividly described in chanakya niti shastra in the sense of shifta charana so niti uh, and the subject matter of niti shastra can also be understood in a very uh, specialized manner in this sense of shifta charana then if we try to understand this particular sense or interpretation of niti uh, where it is understood uh, to be synonymous with danda niti uh, within uh, the larger scope and range of bharatiya knowledge systems uh, it will be important for uh, our understanding of niti shastra why because uh, as i was telling often uh, these two words these two terms rather danda niti and niti or niti shastra are synonymously used so trying to understand where dandaniti fits in within the entire range of bharatiya knowledge systems the uh, classical taxonomy that we have uh, in this country the indigenous taxonomy or the scheme of classification of the uh, various knowledge systems of bharatiya gyan parampara uh, will be useful in understanding niti shastra so looking at that uh, classical taxonomy that i was talking about we first find that there are four fold divisions trai varta anvikshiki and dandaniti trai varta anvikshiki and dandaniti these are the four fold uh, scheme of classification of bharatiya knowledge systems this classification uh, you can come across uh, it is mentioned in the arthashastra of kautilya the arthashastra text of kautilya as well as in kamandakya niti sara both of them mention this of course there were earlier uh, ways of classifying cl classifying uh, bharatiya knowledge systems in a three fold or sometimes even two fold manner ascribed to the various schools of thought and various acharyas such as uh, brihaspati such as shukra or ushanas etc those are also mentioned uh, very reverently by uh, both kamandaka as well as kautilya but uh, both of them Uh, have come to emphasize that uh, this is the proper classification uh, to divide the entire range of bharatiya knowledge systems into these four parts or categories trai varta anvikshiki and dandaniti so uh, what do they pertain to trai is uh, that branch of bharatiya knowledge systems where we talk about the vedic literature the uh, uh, vedas uh, rigved Uh, yajurveda samaveda atharvaveda and the entire literature that pertains to uh, the vedic universe uh, the vedangas and uh, even all the uh, darshanas which uh, evolve out of the vedas they come under the subject matter of trai then varta uh, corresponds to that branch of bharatiya knowledge systems uh, where we discuss about Uh, how to properly manage cattle how to conduct agriculture and commerce etc anvikshiki uh, is that branch where we talk about analytical philosophy so to speak in the in the proper uh, 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 western sense of the term philosophy it is actually analytic philosophy and there we try to understand how to think more clearly and to uh, repair woolly thinking so that uh, uh, takes the help of logical inference how to uh, understand and uh, deploy logic how to use syllogistic devices uh, using language how we can uh, clarify concepts so ideas and concepts the clarification of concepts and uh, coming to inferential knowledge that is basically the subject matter of anvikshi and finally in dandaniti we come to discuss uh, all those subjects that pertain to 
the smooth functioning of a society as well as a government. So whenever uh, some human society exists in a place at a specific time, it has to have some or the other form of governance. It has to uh, organize itself as a society. It has to uh, evolve uh, hierarchies in order to uh, conduct its day-to-day -day business and to protect itself from harm and from internal conflicts and so on. So all those things have come to be identified as uh, uh, discussed under Dandaniti, that category of Bharatiya knowledge systems. So this is the place of Dandaniti within the entire gamut of Bharatiya knowledge systems. Now, if we talk about the different source texts of Dandaniti, uh, the texts upon which the entire Dandaniti, uh, the subject of Dandaniti depends, uh, draws its sustenance from, these are uh, mainly uh, these category of texts. Some of these are texts in themselves and some of them are categories. Uh, I will mention them one by one. First of all, Kautilya Arthashastra. It is the Arthashastra of Kautilya, that text which discusses Dandaniti in the fullest manner possible. And fortunately, we are in possession of this text uh, in this time. Then we have Kamandakiya Niti Sara. It also talks about Dandaniti in, in uh, a great detail. And uh, also it, it draws uh, um, a lot of themes uh, uh, from uh, the Kautilya Shastra itself. We also have Shukra Niti Sara, uh, the mention of which we can find in various texts, various other texts, such as in the Mahabharata. And uh, there is also uh, a sort of uh, uh, manuscript available, or uh, multiple manuscripts actually available for Shukra Niti Sara. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, the Smriti literature, the literature that we find uh, uh, as uh, you know the twofold divisions of Shruti and Smriti. The Smriti literature uh, actually uh, deals in certain sections with Dandaniti. Then we also have the Itihasa Purana literature. Uh, in uh, a significant portion of the Itihasa Purana literature, we get to uh, have discussions on Dandaniti proper. So Itihasa Purana can also be considered as uh, a very important source of Dandaniti. And finally, in the Kavya and Sahitya, uh, in, in the various Mahakavyas uh, uh, by the great uh, poets, uh, such as the Bhatti Kavya or Maghas Shishupalavatha or uh, Bharavi's Kirata Arjunian, uh, we get to have discussions on Dandaniti as sort of uh, dialogues between various characters. So all of these, the Kautilya Arthashastra, Kamandaki Niti Sara, Shukra Niti Sara, portions of the Smriti literature like the Agyavalkya Smriti, Manu Samhita, and uh, Itihasa Purana texts, certain sections of the Ramayana, certain sections of the Mahabharata, especially the uh, Shanti Parva of Mahabharata, Udyoga Parva also some sections, uh, and Kavya Sahitya, uh, as I was telling, various Mahakavyas uh, have actually discussed what Dandaniti is. So all these can be considered as the uh, source texts of Dandaniti. Here, I would like to take a very uh, small break and uh, check with you if you have any questions or if, uh, uh, if there are any confusions uh, regarding whatever I have discussed so far. I would be very glad to take a few questions. Thank you, Shrizidji. I would request the participants to use the raise hand option if you would like to ask a question. The chat box is also open now. If you would like to post your thoughts, reflections over there as well, it's welcome. Shrijitji, so we have uh, a question from Dr. B. Padmajaji. She asks, can you explain 
Anvik Siki again. Sure. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So uh, yes, Anvik Siki, as I was describing, uh, is one of the fourfold uh, classifications of Bharatiya knowledge system. Firstly, and uh, uh, apart from the Trayi Varta and Dandaniti, Anvik Siki specializes in discussing such topics where we talk about how to think in a proper manner, how to improve our thinking uh, in a rational and logical manner. Uh, and uh, uh, the main components of Anvikshiki are really uh, found in the Nyaya Darshana. Uh, uh, Nyaya Darshana, uh, the whole of it uh, is actually uh, talking about how to deal with Anvikshiki. And uh, even in the Vaisheshika, to a great extent, and even in the Purva Mimamsa uh, of the uh, six uh, so-called orthodox uh, darshanas that we have, uh, these three, uh, you know, uh, in some way or the other, deal with Anvikshiki. So Anvikshiki should be understood as that branch, one of those uh, four principal branches of Bharatiya knowledge systems, where we talk about analytic philosophy, so to speak, if we have to use a sort of Western parallel to understand what uh, this particular branch of Bharatiya knowledge systems deals with, Anvikshiki is that branch where we talk about uh, how to use the language that we use uh, in a day-to-day -day conversation or communication or thinking uh, in a proper manner, how to cure uh, bad thinking or woolly thinking, as I was saying, and uh, to come to logical inferences using, using several devices like syllogistic devices, linguistic devices, and so on and so forth. Hope that uh, addresses the uh, query. Yes. Thank you, Srijitji. We have a question from Sanjeevji. Please yes. go ahead, sir. Uh, you know, if we do, when we take this knowledge to young India, one question comes up, it will come up that, uh, do you have some, do you, you see some issue between, you know, this wonderful knowledge and the fact that alongside discriminatory practices carried on, especially with regard to women? How do we reconcile this? You know, because here we have one view and on the ground, how do we reconcile the two? Yeah, I think uh, reconciling these two uh, are. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a certain sense, it is not uh, the same category that we're talking about when we try to impart the Bharatiya knowledge systems and the uh, uh, very useful branches of understanding uh, the world and human psyche and uh, even uh, the pursuits of the human life, etc. Uh, they are uh, useful in order to uh, uh, not just attain uh, one's material goals, material fulfillment, but also one's uh, spiritual fulfillments, uh, one's uh, well-being in the uh, holistic sense of uh, the term. So uh, psychologically, materially, and spiritually, uh, attaining well-being for any human being uh, is the goal proper for uh, Bharatiya knowledge systems. And uh, the sort of discriminations towards uh, certain sections of society, maybe uh, it's women, maybe it's a, a certain uh, strata of the society, uh, all those discriminations have uh, existed across all time, all spaces and all societies. So I'm not really sure uh, why the question of uh, reconciling uh, discrimination will uh, be dealt with, uh, you know, imparting the knowledge systems that we are talking about. So uh, I think uh, there is a proper uh, uh, place to discuss that particular issue. It is an important issue. Discrimination is bad. And uh, we have to also understand what, what are the sources of discrimination. And we can take that discussion in the proper context. But I do not really see how uh, it will be problematic to discuss uh, any particular branch of Bharatiya knowledge system, not just Niti Shastra, but any particular branch of knowledge systems while not addressing the discrimination that uh, India uh, as a society has, uh, has had to deal with. 
So it's like, uh, uh, you know, uh, if I have to uh, draw a sort of uh, analogy, if I am discussing uh, physics, uh, then we cannot really start discussing about uh, what sort of discrimination has happened to the black people in America or in uh, Britain. So uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? If not, then we will proceed with the rest of the presentation. Yes, we did. We can okay. Okay. Thank you. So after the fourfold division of uh, uh, Bharatiya knowledge systems and trying to understand where Dandaniti, which is a specific way of interpreting and understanding what Niti is and what Niti Shastra deals with, that part, if it is clarified, then we will go into Dandaniti in a little more detail. The source text of Dandaniti, as I have been telling you, Kautilya, uh, Arthashastra, Kamandakya, Niti Sara, Shukra Niti Sara, or Oshanas Tantra, sometimes it is uh, uh, you know, referred to as, the Shukra Niti Sara is also referred to as Oshanas Tantra, uh, named after Ushanas, another name for Shukra. Uh, some parts of the Smriti literature, some parts of the Kihasa Purana, and uh, also of Kavya and Sahitya. Now, if we properly look at the Itihasa Purana uh, sections where Tandaniti has been uh, discussed in detail, then we get to see that in the Valmiki Ramayana, the Adi Kavya, uh, we have discussion of Dandaniti in the Ayodhya Kanda, the, in the 100th chapter. It is actually a very uh, important chapter in, in the whole of Ramayana, in the sense that uh, here we get to see uh, that Bharata has come to Sri Rama when he has undertaken his uh, journey into the deep forests and spending 14 years of exile in the forest. Uh, as was demanded by uh, Kaikeyi, uh, Bharata has come to Rama. And uh, Sri Rama is uh, quite uh, uh, astonished to find that Bharata has come to the forest, uh, leaving uh, the kingdom, because uh, he thinks that uh, the uh, people who are in, in charge of running uh, the uh, government, who are uh, charged with the smooth functioning of government, must never leave the capital or the place which is being governed by them. So Rama undertakes a conversation uh, where he uh, discusses the importance of uh, Dandaniti with Bharata. And because uh, all these verses were this, or rather most of the verses, leaving maybe uh, a few, only a handful of verses, uh, most of these start with uh, the word uh, Kachit. And therefore it has been also uh, termed as the Kachit Sarga, the 100 Sarga of uh, Ayodhya Kanda of Valmiki Ramayana is known as Kachit Sarga, where uh, Rama discusses the importance of Dandaniti. And in, in, in the course of that conversation, uh, Rama ends up giving some very important lessons on uh, governance, on polity, on leadership. So if you want to understand Dandaniti, then a very close, careful scrutiny, uh, very uh, close reading of uh, this particular chapter of uh, Ayodhya Kanda in Vamiki Ramayana is uh, important. And also in the Yuddha Kanda, in the sixth chapter, uh, uh, sorry, in the Yuddha Kanda, six to ten sagas, we get to see Dandaniti again being discussed in the Vamiki Ramayana. Coming to Vyasa's Mahabharata, you know, uh, a text which is uh, much more vast in scope uh, compared to Vamiki Ramayana. And as a result, uh, the subject of Dandaniti uh, keeps coming up at various parvas or the books of uh, the Mahabharata. So, for example, in the Shanti Parva, we get to see uh, the Prachetas Manu's Niti, uh, you know, in uh, the chapters 57, uh, 112 uh, of the Shanti Parva, and Kalaka Vrikshya Niti, uh, and Rajadharma, uh, especially, where we talk about. Dandaniti, uh, its 
origin where the Asthana Dandariti come from, the Brahma created and, uh, uh, you know, 10 million shlokas uh, uh, and then uh, Shiva had uh, summarized it and from there Indra, from Indra to Vyaspati, from Vyaspati to Shukra and so on and so forth, finally coming down to uh, the modern day Acharyas. So uh, that entire lineage of Dandariti is actually described in the Rajatharma part of Shanti Parva of Yasas Mahabharata. Another part of uh, Mahabharata where we get to see discussion of Dandaniti is actually the Sabha Parva where Narada gets into uh, a very detailed discourse of how to properly conduct the uh, business of governance, how to be a proper ruler of the subjects uh, uh, because uh, Yudhishthira was being crowned at that time and Narada uh, takes that opportunity to counsel him to uh, teaching certain lessons, so to speak, on uh, the uh, conduct of rulership, on uh, how to have a smooth and uh, well-functioning government, where happiness of the Praja is of the central concern. Another part uh, of Vyasa's Mahabharata, in the Adi Parva, we get to see the Kanikaniti. Similarly, in the Udyoga Parva, we get to find Matanganiti, uh, Vidula Anushasana, not Vidura Anushasana, or not to be confused with Vidura's Anushasana, Vidula Anushasana, and also Gandhari's Anushasana. Uh, all of these Anushasana uh, sort of uh, uh, discourses, some, some vadas, where each of these characters of the Mahabharata, for example, Gandhari, they impart the wisdom, the knowledge of uh, governance of uh, Dandaniti in a very detailed manner. And in, in a sublime manner, because it is also uh, poetry. So they are not just informative, they are, I would say, inspiring. So if you get into these particular sections of the Mahabharata in the Shanti Parva or Sabha Parva, Adi Parva, Udyoga Parva, you'll be able to find some extremely uh, good formulation of Dandaniti. Similarly, in the Ashrama Vasika Parva, you get to see Dhritarashtra's Anushasana. You see, Dhritarashtra, who is uh, often understood to be, uh, you know, a sort of failure and uh, not a proper king, not a proper monarch, who uh, failed to live up to his duty as not just uh, a king, but also as uh, a father and a guardian of the uh, Pandavas as well as the Kauravas, because of his overindulgence of uh, some of his sons. Uh, but uh, we have to also keep in mind that this is the same Dhritarashtra who was uh, the student of uh, people like Bhishma and Vidura. So, uh, and Bhishma and Vidura, these people are considered to be the greatest authorities of their time on the subject of Dandaniti. And uh, Dhritarashtra got the uh, best chance to spend, uh, you know, the highest amount of time with them. They were always uh, flanking them on both sides, flanking him on both sides. And uh, as a result, he got to uh, uh, derive a lot of benefit from the counsel and the knowledge, uh, the wisdom on the divinity that both Bhishma and Vidura had. Finally, I would also like to mention that the Barhaspatya Tantra and Oshanas Tantra, Brihaspati and Shukra, these two great traditional acharyas of Dandaniti, their systems on Dandaniti, how they formulated the entire subject and how they expounded that, what were the channels of disseminating that knowledge uh, on Dandaniti through these two particular uh, acharyas or their schools, Barhaspatya and Oshanas, the Barhaspatya from Brihaspati, Oshanas from Ushanas or Shukra. Uh, these two come again and again within the Mahabharata. So uh, a very close scrutiny of the Mahabharata is needed in order to uh, extract and maybe compile uh, uh, the branch of knowledge that is known as Niti Shastra and in particular that interpretation of Niti Shastra that we have uh, described as Dandaniti. So Mahabharata's Vyasa and uh, Vyasa, Vyasa's Mahabharata and uh, Valmiki Ramayana, these two texts of the Itihasa tradition are very, very important when it comes to understanding Dandaniti or Niti Shastra. Now, if you look at the source texts within Sahitya and Kavya for Dandaniti, we will see that uh, Dandaniti in Kavya Sahitya can be found in Bhatti Kavya from the 12th chapter, 14th shloka onwards. 
And uh, uh, it's important to also note its similarity with Valmiki Ramayana's uh, exposition of the Niniti as described in its Yuddha Kanda, as I was mentioning in the previous slide, from uh, six to 10 sagas of the Yuddha, Yuddha Kanda and uh, a quarterly Arthashastra sixth and seventh Adhikaranas of the uh, 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 sub chapters, so to speak. Uh, these are uh, finding uh, uh, a lot of similarity, a lot of echo in what has been discussed in the Bhatti Kavya in the uh, 12th chapter. Then in the Kirat Arjunyam, we get to see a lot of discussion of the Andaniti. Kirat Arjunyam is also uh, based on themes taken from uh, the Mahabharata. Shishu Palavata, another uh, great Mahakavya, which derives its themes from the uh, Mahabharata. There also in the second sarga, we get uh, a very uh, very deep analysis of Dandaniti through some discourses between Sri Krishna, Balarama, and so on. And uh, if we come to the, the modern uh, literatures who are deeply rooted in the Bharatiya knowledge system, you will see that Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyaya's Anandamat, uh, the, the seminal work by Bankim Chandra, uh, where we have the concept of Anushilam Tattva. Uh, and the concept of uh, uh, the country, the nation, as a revered goddess uh, uh, the, the, uh, who has been equated with the threefold forms of the goddess, namely Durga, Kali, and Jagadhatri. There also, uh, in the discourses of the Santan, uh, you know, uh, the sannyasis who have taken up arms to free their land, namely Bengal in this case, from the uh, tyrants uh, who were uh, the firstly the Islamic invaders and the uh, British who were also uh, coming at, at, a, at a particular time around 1757 to uh, the end of the 18th century. Uh, that is the uh, specific setting of Bankim's Anandabad. And there we get to see that the various uh, conversations between the members of this Santandal, which has uh, led this uprising against the tyrants, uh, they discuss about what Dandaniti is. And uh, through the conversations of uh, uh, the sannyasi, uh, the chief sannyasi, uh, the uh, sannyasi named Dhirananda, Bhavananda, and Mahindra, and so on and so forth, these characters uh, discuss Dandaniti in a great detail. So, a re close reading of Bankim's Anandamat will also give you some idea about what uh, Dandaniti is. And finally, I would also like to mention from our modern uh, literature, Tego's, Rabindranath Tego's essays in a particular anthology of essays called Bharata Varsha. I'm not sure if the entire text of Bharata Varsha, this anthology of essays by Tego has been translated into uh, languages other than uh, the source, uh, namely Bangla, but uh, there is an English translation of uh, uh, one particular uh, essay within this anthology uh, by Tego, which is called Brahmana, uh, and uh, there we get to see some discussion on uh, uh, Dandaniti and uh, on Niti in general, I would say, not just Dandaniti, but uh, on Niti in general. Niti that pertains to the smooth functioning of a society in the Indian context. That is what is uh, discussed in detail in this particular uh, essay called Brahmana by Tagore, which is actually available in English translation. Now, moving ahead, uh, if we look at the Smriti literature, uh, you know, the twofold divisions of Shruti and Smriti, Shruti dealing with uh, the Vedas, uh, the revelations, and Smriti, uh, which are uh, the, uh, the, the ways of conducting one's life uh, in, in the personal sphere as well, in the, as well as in the social sphere. So it, it encompasses the uh, entire the group of activities, endeavors that uh, uh, human beings can take. Uh, and uh, there uh, we get to see in the uh, Nitakshara, which is basically a commentary on uh, uh, Yagya Valkya Smriti, uh, there is a very beautiful formulation of uh, what uh, Niti, and especially uh, uh, when it is interpreted as Dandaniti, is. And uh, I would like to uh, mention this particular uh, shloka uh, first to describe what uh, is meant by Dandaniti or Niti in general uh, following Mitakshara. So this shloka goes uh, as Adhishwa Putrakadhishwa Tubhyam Dasyami Mudakan. 
यद्वान्यस्मै प्रदास्यामि कर्णम उत्पाटयामि ते ओके यद्वान्यस्मै प्रदास्यामि कर्णम उत्पाटयामि ते ओके सो दिस एक्चुअली डिस्क्रिप्शन अ वेरी ब्यूटीफुल मैनर दैट व्हिच वी नो एज द सामदान दंड एंड भेद द फोरफोल्ड divisions of niti when it comes to interpreting it as danda niti so here basically uh, the smriti is describing how samadana danda bheda can be uh, deployed by either a monarch or uh, you know anybody in their personal and social undertakings uh, through the analogy of uh, how a parent deal with a child so here basically a parent is uh, desirous of uh, their children to uh, get into the study mode so they want them to uh, take care of their studies and in order to do that the parent is first asking the child sweetly is uh, sharing he or she is sharing very sweet words uh, uh, please read uh, uh, my good son or my good daughter and all those things that parents usually say uh, and uh, when that has not worked then uh the parent goes on uh, to take another strategy so to speak where you can gift some uh, chocolates and gifts and various other things that children are usually attracted to uh, those things can be gifted to children so that they are induced into the study mode so that they start their studies uh, and take their studies more seriously and if even that fails then those same gifts that were being uh, given to the children can be given to some other people their peers maybe the sisters and brothers the cousins uh, and their friends uh, while at the same time uh, making sure that the child who the parent wants to get into the study mode is watching it so he gets to know that whatever gifts uh, he should have uh, attained from their parents uh, is actually being attended by some other fellow uh, some other child so that might induce uh, the child to get into the study mode and even if that also fails uh, even if that also fails then karnam utpata karnam utpatayami te then uh, i will get into the uh, punishing mode then i will go into physical punishment uh, so these actually are very good analogies for understanding what samadana danda bheda is so when we are talking to as parents when we are talking to the children in, in using sweet words to induce them into uh, what we want them to do their proper behavior and conduct uh, that is sama and when we want to induce them by giving gifts that is dana when we are giving those same gifts to uh, their peers uh, their brothers sisters and cousins that is uh, bheda and finally when we are giving some sort of punishment physical punishment or maybe rebuking them scolding them all that comes under danda uh, the same uh, understanding can be applied for governing human being society uh, in general so that is uh, something that we find find in the smriti literature so smriti literature the point of, of saying all this is that uh, the smriti literature is also a very very important source of uh, understanding what niti is and uh, especially what danda niti is in the yagya valkya smriti in order to give you some details of these source texts uh, i can uh, mention the achara adhyaya the shlokas 317 and 350 along with uh, the commentary upon them uh, which is known as bala krida uh, and also the shlokas 307 323 along with the commentary bala krida again uh, where the details of bureaucracy which is uh, uh, often uh, understood to be a very important component of uh, a well functioning government uh, there we get to see a discussion on uh, bureaucracy its definitions its divisions its classifications the specific roles of uh, people who are running the bureaucracy uh, so all all those things are described in this particular uh, section of the yagya vakya smriti Uh, within the shlokas 304 and 306 you can find them in the yagya vakya smriti then uh, you will also find within the yagya vakya smriti itself what is known as vaishala akshatantra uh, as i was telling you in some previous slide that uh, in the rajadharma uh, uh, parva of uh, uh, the shanti parva in mahabharata uh, we get to find the mention of vaishala akshatantra 
and Vishalaksha derives its name from Vishalaksha, one who has large eyes, Vishala or large eyes, meaning uh, Mahadev, Shiva. So uh, it is said that when uh, those 10 million verses were prepared by Brahma, Prajapati Brahma, in order to give the knowledge of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Dandanati, uh, it was first Shiva who had uh, collated them and compiled them, abridged them, so to speak. Uh, in a uh, much more compact version. And that particular uh, uh, you know, rendition of the system of uh, knowledge known as Dandaniti is known as Vaishalaksha Tantra. And uh, the proper mention and de uh, of the details of this particular Tantra can be found again in the Acharatyaya of the Yagyavarkya Smriti. Uh, it it uh, describes it, it mentions it. Uh, along with the commentary, Balakrida, it uh, explains what this Tantra is all about. And as I was saying in the Mitakshara commentary by Vidyaneshwara uh, on uh, the Yagyavarkya Smriti uh, is also a very important uh, inspiring source text for understanding the Nirmiti. Then Manusamhita, uh, one of the uh, most important uh, texts in the Smriti literature. Uh, we will find that the particular chapter, the chapter 7, is actually uh, dealing with Tandamiti in a lot of, with a lot of details. Uh, you know, uh, for example, the eightfold duty of kings has been described here. And in this, uh, in this regard, the commentary by Medhatiti on the Manusamrita or the Manusmriti will be very helpful. Uh, if you go to the shlokas uh, 7, 8, uh, and uh, sorry, the, the shlokas 8 and 155 to 157 uh, in the seventh chapter, you will find a lot of such discussions uh, which are uh, relevant for the subject of Dandaniti. And also, uh, uh, chapter five, 5, shloka 45, along with Vedatiti's commentary uh, of the Manusamhita, will give you a lot of uh, important information on Dandaniti. For example, the very uh, crucial test of uh, the employees of a government, the senior uh, bureaucratic officials, for example, the Amatya and the Pariksha, the test uh, of who are the eligible people uh, who are uh, fit to be in this position of the Amatya has been described in great detail in the Manusamhita. So there also, along with Medhatiti's commentary uh, in, in, of the shlokas 177, 180, 183, in the seventh chapter of the Manusamhita, will give you uh, these details pertaining to specific subjects under Dandaniti. And finally, uh, Dandaniti uh, also spread, you know, Dandaniti as well as Niti, I should say, in the uh, most general uh, manner of understanding the term Niti, has spread through oral tradition. So, so far, whatever we have been uh, uh, discussing the text, the source texts of uh, Dandaniti and Niti Shastra, they are uh, mainly uh, texts which are written down. So uh, we have uh, available manuscripts and from those manuscripts in modern times, scholars uh, from both India as well as abroad have prepared what we call critical edition using the, uh, using the uh, technique or the methodology of lower criticism. Uh, which is a particular tool or technique in the uh, subject of philology to create a, a critical edition, how to create a critical edition of an in, ancient manuscript that is available. So all of that uh, that we have discussed so far, uh, the um, Smriti literature, uh, the Itihasa Purana uh, uh, sections which deal with Dandaniti and also the Kavya and Sahitya, all those are written texts. But also we have you know, uh, the oral tradition that has given uh, and which has preserved uh, till this day a lot of the knowledge of Dandaniti. Now, at the head of this oral uh, tradition, there is, of course, uh, a twofold division of both the written text and also uh, what is purely oral, which has uh, been transmitted uh, through Guru Shishya Parampara or through even uh, family members, you know, uh, one senior member of a family, like a grandfather or grandmother, telling stories, uh, you know, uh, to their grandchildren or their children. They, they, those uh, ways are also very, very effective in, uh, in, in preserving the knowledge of Niti and the Daniti in particular. So Panchatantra is one such text. So Panchatantra is also available, luckily, uh, in the written uh, uh, mode. We have critical editions of Tantra, uh, Panchatantra, but 
uh, what is very interesting is to notice that the Panchatantra has given rise to a very wide ranging and uh, I would say a global tradition of uh, oral literature or orator, as some people often describe oral literature. Uh, so Panchatantra gets translated uh, into Arabic, uh, you know, mainly uh, when the uh, Arab uh, 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 commercial people, the merchants had come to India and they uh, got to know about uh, uh, this particular text called Panchatantra uh, along with the invaders. They uh, translated uh, Panchatantra into uh, a text called Kalila Vadimna. Okay. Uh, so uh, these are actually, uh, you know, the uh, upper Brahmsha forms in Arabic uh, of the principal characters uh, of Panchatantra. And from that particular Arabic text, uh, that uh, story, that the entire tradition of stories, as is found in Panchatantra, got proliferated all throughout the world in, in Europe uh, and also uh, in the Middle East. It was translated into several languages, Syria, Greek, Hebrew and Latin. And finally, in the modern European languages as well, mainly from the Arabic text, but also from the uh, Latin text and several motifs. Uh, of the Panchatantra as is found in the Panchatantra. Uh, for example, the cunning fox or, you know, uh, the anthropomorphic animals, meaning animals who, who are like humans, they can think like humans, they talk like humans and they act like human beings. Uh, those motifs have been derived actually from Panchatantra through this oral tradition and they have been, uh, they have found their way into the classical literature of uh, medieval to uh, early modern Europe. For example, uh, in the works of uh, the Italian uh, uh, author Boccaccio and also of the famous stories of the Grimm brothers and uh, of the uh, author La Fontaine, uh, all of them have derived these motifs and themes from uh, uh, the uh, stories related to Niti uh, as is found in the Panchatantra through this oral tradition and this tradition of translations uh, at large. Now, if we come to a particular uh, text of uh, uh, Niti Shastra, uh, namely the Chanakya Niti Shastra, I have been also telling you a lot about uh, the texts uh, which can be found in the Itihasa tradition and in the Smriti tradition, but uh, there are certain texts which are uh, which come to our mind at first when we talk about Niti Shastra as a distinct branch of knowledge within the Bharatiya knowledge systems. Uh, the Chanakya Niti Shastra is one such text. And it consists of 108 odd shlokas, uh, maybe a little more. And they are often described as subhashitas or well articulated uh, maxims, adages, or verses. So, uh, if we look at the text of uh, this Chanakya Niti Shastra, which is ascribed to Chanakya, uh, or the other name of Kautilya, the author of Arthashastra, this is also very pertinent in trying to understand the interrelationship between the various interpretations of uh, Niti as Danda Niti and uh, Hitopadesha or Anushasana Vaktya and so on and so forth, the uh, divisions and uh, interpretations that I have uh, described in the previous slides. Uh, this is very important to uh, note that the same author uh, who, uh, who is ascribed to the text of Arthashastra, the principal text on Danda Niti proper, is also uh, the author uh, as is held by the tradition of this uh, Niti Shastra text, Chanakya Niti Shastra. If you look at the text, we find that it has several themes, but those themes are not very well organized in terms of, uh, you know, the specific subject matters that they're dealing with. For example, the theme of the proper conduct of the wise, the, uh, the Vidwan, has been dealt with in verses uh, as, uh, uh, you know, distant as 3 and 32 within the Chanakya Niti Shastra. Or uh, another example for this is the nature of an unwise individual, the Murkha, as is uh, uh, mentioned in the Chanakya Niti Shastra. What is the characteristics of a Murkha and what sort of uh, things we should avoid so that we do not uh, become a Murkha or identified with a Murkha? They are described in verses as dispersed as the second verse, the 13th verse, the 84th verse, 85th verse, and similarly, many other subject matters many other themes uh, which are discussed in the uh, Subhashitas of the Chanakya Niti Shastra are dispersed throughout the text. 
So what are the main themes of the Chanakya Niti Shastra? Mainly the praise of Vidya, which is understood in various ways as self-knowledge, also as secular knowledge, wisdom, praise of the wise and those who are proficient in the Shastras, and denunciation of lack of wisdom, uh, uh, you know, denunciation of the Murkha, as I was telling you, knowledge, uh, lack of knowledge, and uh, those who are unwise. Also, determination of who is a true friend and the proper way of uh, bringing up children. These are uh, the themes of Chanakya Niti Shastra. The praise of those children who observe their duties to their parents uh, also consists of a central theme. And the right place or country where one should inhabit, where one should live with their family, where one should build up a society, which sort of uh, monarch or ruler uh, uh, or governor you should live under, that is also discussed, very interesting subject. Uh, and finally, conjugal relationship, as well as lessons from nature. So here I would like to mention one thing. There is this common notion or perception that the Chanakya Niti Shastra or the Subhashitanis in general, also another very important text uh, within the uh, you know, subject of uh, uh, Niti Shastra, which is Bhartrihari's Niti Shataka. You know, but he had written these three texts, Vairagya Shataka, Niti Shataka. Uh, and uh, Niti Shataka is often uh, clubbed with uh, Chanakya Niti Shastra, and they are uh, you know, sometimes described as uh, texts which should be read by everybody uh, of all ages, and especially they are introduced to children, even. Uh, I would suggest that uh, this is not the proper understanding of uh, either the Chanakya Niti Shastra or the Niti Shataka of uh, Bhartrihari, because they do not merely talk about subjects which are in general talking about the good conduct of a person or the proper place of uh, uh, you know, categories of people like Murkha or Pandita or Vidwan and so on and so forth. But they're also talking about conjugal relationship. Uh, they're talking about uh, how to uh, you know, uh, conduct the business uh, uh, you know, of propagating one's family, how, uh, how one should uh, be very, very careful in uh, uh, conducting marriage and uh, getting into a conjugal relationship, what sort of person you should be in a conjugal relationship with. All these are also subject matters of uh, the Chanakya Niti Shastra. And you know, the uh, very interesting thing about Bhartrihari's Niti Shataka is that uh, you know, it, it takes its inspiration as is uh, uh, described in the uh, first few shlokas of the Niti Shataka of Bhartrihari uh, is from a, a scorned lover, you know, uh, or rather Bhartrihari himself is a scorned lover and he has himself scorned some other people who are attracted to him. And uh, because he has come to understand the futility of uh, uh, such kind of uh, thinking or such kind such state of existence, such mode of being, uh, he has undertaken this uh, uh, business of writing down the nitis or the anushasanas. So I would suggest that we should uh, have a proper understanding of who are the right audience of uh, Chanakya Niti Shastra or Bharti Hari's uh, Niti Shataka are. Uh, obviously, the entire text uh, of Chanakya Niti Shastra or the uh, Niti Shataka of Bhartrihari are not meant for uh, people of all ages, especially not for children. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, certain sections, certain selections, perhaps, uh, uh, can be proper for uh, people of all ages. But the text in its entirety, uh, either Chanakya Niti Shastra or uh, Bhartrihari's Niti Shataka, actually uh, should be read and understood uh, and practiced even because none of the uh, you know, branches of Bharatiya knowledge systems are merely for theoretical knowledge, they are meant for praxis, they are going to uh, be imbibed in one's day-to-day -day life, in their living practice. So this should be uh, introduced to people in their entirety, these texts, uh, the two texts that I have mentioned of Chanakya and Bhartrihari, to people who have attained a certain uh, maturity of age of understanding. So with this, I would like to uh, stop I think we are running out of time. We have some half an hour uh, to have questions and answers. Am I correct, Shriari? Yes, Shriji. Thank you so much. We have about uh, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes for questions. Sure. All right.
again requesting the participants uh, to kindly use the raise hand option if you would like to ask a question and uh, also the chat box is there for you to post your questions yes we have uh, kayal viri ji requesting you to go ahead ma'am so it was a wonderful session sir now uh, as administration uh, administrator in a institution uh, is uh, what is the kind of means by which we apply niti in the college level or in the higher secondary level and the primary level okay uh, uh, could you please repeat your question ma'am uh, i just want to uh, i missed a certain part of your question the means by which we follow the niti in the primary school level uh the secondary school level and the college level okay correct me if i am wrong in understanding your question uh, are you asking uh, at what stage of our uh, you know present scheme of educational uh, uh, system we should introduce the subject of niti shastra as understood through the texts of chanakya or bhartrihari at what no, no, stage no, no, we should no 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 the kind of dand uh, sorry i, I was mistaken dandaniti we have to apply for uh, bringing the administration inside the schools so we cannot follow the same dandaniti in the uh, different uh, levels so how okay. do we bring okay. about because for children we have to look at a different level for higher secondary at a different level and the right. college level it should be at a different level now for how right. uh, administrator should look into it understood i understood i think you're talking about danda and not okay. dandaniti uh, specifically because dandaniti itself uh, consists of uh, all the other three um, you know means of uh, bringing people into discipline samadana bheda and then there is the fourth pillar the ultimate pillar the last uh, recourse which is danda so uh, it is up to the understanding of the wise people who are proficient in the niti shastra themselves and through their understanding through their common sense through their daily interaction and understanding of the students or why the students it can be you know the employees uh, in a particular organization one can understand what is the right time and what is the right uh, method of introducing these principles when one can do sama when one can uh, when, when when one is forced to apply bheda and uh, when dana will actually do the job and finally when we need to go for the punitive action punishment so uh, i'll give you an example from organizational structure okay so in corporate culture or even now in you know mm. education institutions uh, for teachers we have something called performance review or mm. appraisal right yes. so Uh, that is the time which comes maybe once a year or twice a year depending on the institution that you are working in and yes. there uh, at that particular point in time when people know that this is the period of appraisal this is the period of performance review you yes. are mentally prepared to yes. listen to your uh, superior listen to your reporting manager that certain kinds of uh, 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 review uh, feedback will be given to you about your work mm -hmm. okay and that is actually the right time to talk about uh, you know uh, dana because you can uh, award them reward them uh, and you can also not reward them that is also uh, one of the principles which is bheda yes. and finally you can also maybe rebuke them scold them uh, which is danda okay mm. of course you are not going to pick up your stick and run after your employee yes. but you can give punitive actions through maybe demotion maybe lack of promotion various other means are there and you can also verbally scold okay which uh, some very strict uh, uh, you know superiors heads of departments actually do with us mm -hmm. from time to time so that is how it should be done but it will be utterly wrong to do that same thing at the wrong time meaning when there is uh, you know still time to come to that phase of appraisal or performance review one should not go into that mode of rebuking or getting into giving some feedback or review whatever unless it is a very very you know uh, serious issue that has arisen am, am i able to uh, explain yes, this yes sir. yes sir. Uh, sir in college level uh, what we follow is 
as i am the head of the department when i do some fatherly treatment i send my faculties for the motherly approach to them so that they don't get agitated uh, at that phase and they are uh, brought to the right phase or i find out the friends of those people and try to do a motherly also so every fatherly treatment is followed by a motherly treatment also in our uh, college that is it right or uh, what is that Abs- kind of absolutely policy? right absolutely right you are actually following the timeless principle of uh, yes. sama and dana uh, uh, by treating your employees in a very affectionate and uh, uh, you know in a manner which is uh, of the mother which is mm-hmm. very good uh but we should also uh, you know use our discretion uh, to understand uh, where the lines can be drawn we, we should not be overly patronizing to people because yes, these yes. are all uh, senior people they they, they yes. are mature and they have their own understanding of the world they they have their own understanding of the situation the roles and the yes. sense of entitlement the sense of duty and self respect as well they yes. they also respect you i'm sure mm. and so we we'll, we we should use our discretion our proper understanding and our common sense in order to draw that particular line uh, to what extent i can uh, you know use that sama or the dana uh, where uh, the line of uh, uh, propriety has not been breached where we have not become uh, overly patronizing okay. so i commend you for the approach that you have yes. taken okay sir thank you for the insights sir. thank you thank you kailvari ji for the question um we have uh, next suman gupta ji requesting you to go ahead ma'am namaskar sir ji thank you so wonderful session and the my question is that is the how the varna is related to the dandani ji how the varna 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 system jo hai brahmar chhatri sudra vaid how the varna system is related to the dandani ji right right so for this ma'am i will uh, actually uh, ask you to go to that particular essay by tagore that i have mentioned during the course of my lecture shrihari can you please share the links to those translations of tagore that i have uh, uh, made for brahmana uh, sure. i will uh, I, you can locate it uh, by simple google search but also you can take it from me uh, i would request uh, some you know you uh, madam Uh, dr gupta yes. to uh, yes. go through the those translations of uh, tagore's uh, essay called brahmana where he is uh, taking uh, you know uh, this uh, taking up the subject of danda uh, yes. with respect to a specific incident that had occurred in maharashtra uh, in the late uh, 19th century and there or maybe early 20th century some sometime in 1904 1903 uh, or 1899 to uh, 1904 Uh, within that period of time in maharashtra one incident occurred which had become a scandal of sorts that a person who belongs to the brahmana varna uh, you know a very high social status in his uh, uh, you know indigenous society had been beaten up by his superior who was actually an englishman with a pair of shoes so at that time it had become a big scandal uh, and uh, this person the, uh, the person who got beaten up actually took the matter to court and uh, very unfortunately the magistrate at the court had dismissed this uh, uh, this this whole petition by saying that it is a trifle you should not bring th- such kind of uh, uh, small issues to me so it was just dismissed summarily by the magistrate uh, the judge in the court to whom uh, this matter was taken so from that incident uh, tagore actually takes uh, uh, you know uh, his cue of discussing what is the role of a particular person who belongs to a particular varna which yeah. is defined as uh, which is defined mainly by the responsibilities you know that that particular person has and uh, may be also to connect this with the previous question that a gentleman had asked me regarding the discrimination i would like to point out here that the varna system that we understand it nowadays is very very uh, convoluted is very very uh, you know uh, wrong uh, one should understand varna not with the privileges that is attached to the varna but with the uh, with the responsibilities not for cost the responsibilities exactly the actions that are expected from so uh, when it is a brahmana then what is expected from a brahmana 
it is expected, I'm, I'm giving you the traditional understanding of a Brahmana, that that person will not run after money, that person will not run after material success, that he will not take a single paisa for imparting the knowledge that he has. And he will, uh, you know, sort of hold an ideal before the entire society, you know, of, of all the other Varnas, where people can look up to him and see an ideal living in that man. Ideal not just confined in the textbooks and given in the shlokas or the mantras, but it is a living idea that a Brahmana is, is what Tagore tells us. And the kind of rigorous discipline that the Brahmana has to live in is unimaginable. It cannot be, uh, you know, lived up to uh, by, you know, uh, uh, by most of the people in the society, even those uh, uh, who are, uh, you know, with, born within the Brahm Brahmana Varna or a Brahmana family uh, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, maybe 1% can actually live up to those high ideals. So our understanding of Varna should be based on the responsibilities that are expected so that people who are hierarchically uh, next to you in the Varna hierarchy of systems, they look up to you and they find in you a sort of guide and ideal to, 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 to check their own basic impulses, to, to check their own uh, uncontrolled impulses to run after material success or to uh, pursue something uh, in excess and that sort of thing. So, Danda uh, is also proportionately given to uh, all these uh, uh, you know, people as per the understanding of what sort of discipline and uh, res uh, responsibility they have to undertake. Because the penances and be because the severe uh, strict kind of discipline that, the, that a Brahmana has to go through, that is not expected from a Kshatriya. And the kind of discipline that a Kshatriya has to go through, that is not expected from a Vaishya. And the kind of discipline that a Vaishya is, is uh, supposed to go, that is not expected from a Shudra. So the entire understanding has to be reversed from what is the privilege of a particular person uh, belonging to a particular Varna to what is the particular responsibility. And from that framework, from that understanding, we can basically appreciate why the texts say uh, what it says about punishment, about Danda, about what are the proper ways of treating. But in the, in, 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 the, in, the, in the current understanding, we understand it only through, uh, you know, rights and privileges. So uh, I have to give a very, very clear uh, statement here. The worldview of the Bharatiya uh, civilization or the Bharatiya Sabhyata is not at all based on rights and privileges. It is based on an entirely on responsibility. It is the responsibilities that you, belonging to a particular hierarchy, a particular stratum of society, a particular class of society, that is going to uh, determine your position in the society, that is going to determine the privileges that you uh, are going to uh, derive from the society. For example, I was talking about the Brahmana, right? That the Brahmana has to uh, live in a particular manner. He cannot take one paisa for the uh, knowledge that he is imparting. It can be knowledge of mathematics, it can be knowledge of uh, engineering, it can be knowledge of the Vedas, whatever it is. It can be knowledge of uh, creating uh, wonderful, grand, uh, sublime murtis. And because the Brahmana has to undertake that sort of a severe life, where he cannot uh, take money in exchange for the Vidya that he is imparting, the entire rest of the society has to take care of the Brahmana. And they have to provide for uh, whatever uh, means are necessary for uh, ha having a proper life, uh, to have enough food, to have enough, uh, uh, you know, clothes on your back, to have uh, a place to live in. All those things have to be provided by the rest of the society, namely the Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra. And so this is the uh, framework through which you can understand the privileges, uh, you know, uh, that are uh, attached to particular varnas. And this is not just for the Brahmana, as I described that certain things are expected from the Brahmana, certain things are expected from the Kshatriya and so on and so forth. So this is what I have to say. So just a responsibility, society is so big, the punishment is so big. Absolutely. It's not a injustice. Injustice in what sense, if you can uh, explain? तो रिस्पांसिबल पर्सन है और उतना समाज के लिए जितना ज्यादा कर रहे हैं और दंड भी उनको उतना ज्यादा मिल रहा है 
काम ज्यादा कर रहे हैं तो उनको दंड तो कम मिलना चाहिए ना No, no, I'll have to uh, correct you in this, uh, uh, madam. Uh, in certain respects, the danda, the punishment for uh, a brahmana, are actually less severe than the danda that is given to a kshatriya. Okay, yes. and uh, in certain other respects, the, the the danda or the punishment is actually severe. So it it is contextual. What sort of action has been undertaken? Wrong wrong action has has been undertaken by a brahmana or a kshatriya or a vaishya or a shudra. That actually determines the nature of the punishment, and that is proportional to the kind of responsibilities that you are supposed to live up. That is all I would say. In order to get the details of these punishments, particular instances, you know, meticulous details, what action uh, attracts what kind of punishment, you have to go to the Manu Samhita uh, as one of the uh, best sources of talking about these punishments in detail. There are other texts, of course, but Manu Samhita will suffice. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suman. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Are there uh, any other questions? Requesting you to raise hand if you have any questions to ask. Yeah, Dr. Sheetal ji, please go ahead. Yeah, Namaste, Sheetal ji. Namaste. I'm just a little curious, knowing your profile, like um, about the various um, you know subjects that you have studied. Um, just on a personal note, I just want to know how has that contributed to your understanding of these scriptures, or you know, has that entirely contributed? Because um, when I look at people who are coming here uh, to deliver, I've seen that, you know, there's a very different kind of a profile that they come with. So I just want to know, like, coming out of the mainstream, like, how has this contributed to your entire understanding of the scriptures? Right. So, uh, um, uh, I'm afraid uh, uh, that uh, some of these things that I say, that they might be taken as self-praise, but... Uh, I would like to mention two things uh, which have uh, kept me rooted in the understanding of Bharatiya knowledge systems, despite my training in uh, science uh, and despite my training in liberal arts uh, uh, and my various experiences of um, mingling with various kinds of people and societies uh, are basically two things that my parents had introduced me to at a very early stage in my life. One is uh, one particular uh, art form, performing, performative arts, uh, uh, which is actually rooted in the Bharatiya knowledge systems, which is music. I uh, have been trained, I have been fortunate enough uh, to receive Talim in the proper Guru Shishya Parampara uh, from uh, eminent people, uh, uh, eminent musicians. Uh, that is one thing. And the other thing was uh, my close organic relationship with my mother's tongue, which is Bangla. So I believe that any uh, Indian person, any Indian individual, any Indian student, at a very young age, he or she should be uh, introduced to these two things. First, they cannot be cut away from their mother's tongue, whatever tongue that is. It can be Telugu, it can be Malayalam, it can be Gujarati, it can be Sindhi, it can be uh, you know uh, Kashmiri. But uh, that is important that the first education starts with the mother's tongue. Uh, and not in English or any other language. You know, uh, it, it is not even advisable that any other Indian language uh, should be uh, one of the uh, you know, uh, ways of imparting knowledge. It should not be. And uh, the other very, very important aspect from my own experience, I can tell, is to be uh, connected with uh, the ethos of Bharatiya Jnana Parampara, is to take up uh, one or the other performative art form. It can be music, it can be dance, it can be painting, it can be sculpting, uh, whatever it can be, but you, you must take that up. So uh, despite uh, my exposure to various kinds of knowledge systems and various ways of looking at the world, uh, uh, I have had the privilege of uh, studying uh, at some of the uh, you know, greatest proponents of postmodernism uh, at Jadavpur University. Uh, who I respect for their views, but I differ with them. Uh, I have uh, been rooted and I have been drawn back to the mainstream of uh, Bharatiya Jnana Parampara because of my uh, initiation into these two things, my organic relationship with my language, Bangla, 
uh, and the uh, other thing is my introduction to uh, the performative art, which is Hindustani music. Thank you, Shijit ji. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? All right, looks like uh, we have run out of questions and uh, there is a lot to reflect on. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry, we have another question. Subhash ji, please go ahead. Sir, uh, I just wanted to ask, what is the concept of a Shastra as against modern academic disciplines like economics, you know, uh, like uh, other disciplines we have, where people do PhD, do collect, you know, data, objective data, and then they conduct experiments. Whereas we have our knowledge in terms of Shastra. So what is the difference between Shastra and modern academic disciplines? Economic, sociology, anthropology, things like that. Hmm. Very good question, Subhashji. Thanks for raising it. Um, uh, this itself can be a very vast topic for discussion and maybe another lecture. But I would uh, just leave you with these thoughts, maybe to reflect upon, that the difference between a Shastra as understood in the uh, Bharatiya civilizational worldview and a science slash discipline slash subject in, in the Western knowledge systems point of view is very, very subtle. Uh, at a very surface level, there is hardly any difference between what is a Shastra and what is a discipline or what is a science. Maybe if I call the science of astronomy and then there is a Shastra uh, which can be analogous to the science of astronomy. There is similarly political economy, political science or economics, uh, all of them taken together if they constitute one branch of knowledge, uh, economics and political science, political economy, and so on and so forth. They can be analogous to one particular Shastra, namely the underneath. Okay. So uh, that way you see that there is very little difference between a Shastra and a science or a discipline. But the crucial, uh, the subtle but very crucial difference is the goal with which a Shastra uh, undertakes its uh, journey of imparting knowledge, as well as what is the uh, what is the end goal, what is derived at the end of attaining knowledge or imparting knowledge, both both ways. It, it is not a one way process. When the teacher is uh, the guru is imparting the knowledge of the shastra and the uh, chatra or the uh, vidyarthi who's attaining the uh, knowledge of the shastra they all are uh, you know uh, supposed to uh, uh, be rooted in this understanding that their ultimate goal is to have a sort of uh, uh, sort of mastery over the material world but to somehow uh, transcend the material so mastery over material world is necessary in order to transcend the material world. You cannot transcend the material world just in one jump. You are not Hanumana. You cannot st start from Prithvi and go to the sun. Okay, we are common mortal beings. So what is the uh, way through uh, which we can uh, go to this Paramarthika uh, goal or the ultimate pursuit, which is the moksha to transcend material, uh, uh, the, the, the limitations of our material existence of a material life. And that is to go through uh, a mastery of the material world. Uh, and in this uh, connection, I would like to mention the first uh, verse of the Ishopanishad. Ishavasyam idam sarvam yat kincha jagatyam jagat tena tyak tena bhunji tha madhridhak kasya svidhanam tena tyak tena bhunji tha. What a beautiful thing to say. You have to do bhoga with tyaga. You cannot go to Tyaga directly. You have to go through Bhoga and then only you will attain Tyaga. So you have to have a mastery over the material things, the material aspect of your existence. And only then one, once you have attained full mastery of it, it may be uh, in two or three lives or maybe 20 lives, but then only you will be able to transcend the material existence. So Shastra has this understanding inherent within. Whatever Shastra you undertake, uh, uh, you know, your uh, uh, training in, it will start with, uh, you know, the, 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 the goal, the stated goal of gaining mastery over the subject, but transcending the subject. 
it can be dandaniti as is the subject uh, the topic of our discussion today you have to attain dandaniti uh, expertise so that all the other aspects the higher and subtle aspects of your existence are taken care of those things cannot be taken care of if you are living in a disorderly society if you are living under a tyrant if you are living under, uh, within an anarchic system so you cannot think about paramarthika you cannot think of moksha when you do not have uh, uh, you know uh, you, when you do not have enough money when you do not have done enough bhoga when you have not understood uh, what bhoga is worth when you have come to under full understanding of the worth of bhoga only then you can appreciate the true worth of tyaga so this is the crucial uh, but very subtle difference between shastra and a discipline of science or subject thank you so much thank you uh, shrijit ji and a thank wonderful you. note to end with uh, tyaga through bhoga uh, very very deep uh, insight which you have shared with all of us thank you so much once again for joining us and sharing about neeti shastra uh, looking forward to listening to you soon dhanyawad dhanyawad thank you 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 until 2 pm the next session will start post lunch uh, by gautam sen ji on international relations so we break now and we'll meet again at 2 pm thank you so much <laughs>